Good? Okay. Glad to see you guys here. How many of you were in my keynote session yesterday? Were there, was there anybody here in the keynote? A few people. Oh, a few people. Okay, good. All right. I didn't want to repeat a couple of things if, uh, if um, all of you had been there. Um, but I'm glad to see, see everybody here. My name is Ingrid Vandervelt. I am the entrepreneur in residence for Dell Incorporated. I oversee entrepreneurial initiatives globally for the company. Uh, like many of you in the room, I am a lifelong entrepreneur. I've built and sold a number of different companies in a number of different industries. The common denominator with all of my companies is that, which by the way, I'm gonna sit down. I'm only standing to, so I can see all of you while we give an intro. The common denominator to all of my companies is that they've had a strong technology backbone. So data mining companies, data analytics, social media. My last two companies were green energy companies. And I'm also a former business television host with CNBC in the United States. And so for this session, I think you all might have been expecting my good friend, Amy Cosper, who is the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. And uh, she was not able to make it. And I got an email from her and the team the day before we all got here. And she said, I'd love for you to do this session. And when I saw what we were talking about, I said, absolutely. I can't wait to meet our speakers, talk with them, meet all of you because the topic that we're gonna talk about today is critically important to any person thinking about or already involved in building their businesses. So we're gonna be talking about entrepreneur psychology, and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as many of us know, uh, at least I get asked a lot, is entrepreneurship something that you're born with, or is it something that can be taught? And what does it take to be a successful entrepreneur? Because I think, you know, when I look at how I built my companies, my first companies, uh, my first company, I went out and raised $7 million in financing and launched my business. Uh, if I look at my colleague, Michael Dell, he launched his first business in college out of the trunk of his car. He was building computers out of his dorm room and then selling them out of the trunk of his car. So very different processes to getting our businesses up and running. Uh, I like to make a joke that Michael Dell now doesn't work for me, I work for him. And he's the one that started it out of the trunk of his car. So we're gonna discuss today with three extraordinary entrepreneurs, very different experiences that they have had in starting their business. And what we want to get out of today is really some ideas and inspiration for everybody here in the room. We're going to have time for questions and answers so you can ask them yourself questions about what, what it took for them to start their businesses. Does that sound good? All right. Before we begin, though, we're, we're really fortunate today. Uh, we've got one of our guests that's going to come up here and uh, provide a greeting from the city of Moscow. Oleg Basharov is the deputy of Moscow City Duma, and uh, he's going to take a couple of minutes before we kick into the presentations. Welcome, Oleg. Thank you, Ingrid. I believe that business and entrepreneurship and psychology notions are extremely philosophical and complex notions that are con being continuously changed in accordance with uh, external uh, economic environment changing. We need to understand that any entrepreneur uh, is going to enter a notion of business, and Henry Ford good, gave a good uh, characteristics. It, business is a deal between the two. One thinks it's beneficial, the other thinks uh, seems to think it's beneficial. And another example is poker. Poker is also an entrepreneurial activity and psychological activity. Um, it requires a lot of psychological uh, experience. And everyone who sits at this table knows the following rule of thumb. If you fail to define within five minutes who is the always losing person at the table, it means that you are this person. And um, entrepreneurial psychology, it's a um, 
individual psychology requiring a high level of self-motivation and self-control. Today's conference, and today, the whole conference of today dedicated to business and government uh, interaction, interaction within business institutions that support entrepreneurship. We need to uh, think about one feature that uh, presents a hindrance and I have already noticed some of psychological conflicts and prevents from business development. Once environment creates some exclusive uh, factors, entrepreneurs uh, act in the following uh, way. Yeah, I need to get this benefit first and to monetize it. Uh, there was a uh, argument with the Ministry of Economy, uh, Maxim Roshetnikov, on RBC Saturday, and he was vouching for big business and he was saying that we have difficult times and we need to uh, uh, give, uh, uh, get big business to the fore. And I, I was saying that well, big business are very serious entrepreneurs and they manage a lot of complex issues. and. You said the most horrible uh, words. Now they'll be thinking not about business, but uh, about monetizing the benefits they can get. And the second specific feature is something that's very specific to Russia, and I want to highlight it in the very beginning. When we are talking about psychological um, uh, aspects of the environment, we need to understand that uh, conflicts, corporate and individual uh, businesses, small inter entrepreneurs uh, issues, tries to get a good rate from a big uh, real estate person. All, all this roots not in today, not in today's law, but uh, in their background uh, where they grew up. And Soviet Union, who brought up bigger part of uh, the uh, entrepreneurs, uh, older entrepreneurs, it taught us two things. Uh, be friends and uh, struggle or war. And in any conflict that we have within Russia, you want to either make friends with somebody and you uh, shift uh, friendly responsibility. Don't, don't haggle with me, you are a friend of mine. Or if you see that you are not managing it, uh, you make uh, an enemy out of him. So you don't want to listen to me, you want to kill business, who are you? And you start insulting and instead of establishing essential business talk, you, you swap to emotions and it's basically struggling, it's a war when people do not hear each other. And when you're talking about efficiency uh, in business and efficiency in business in Moscow, we always need to uh, discuss the following, how entrepreneurs have to contain themselves. What is a startup? Startup is um, benefits that are uh, uh, not typical uh, to bigger businesses. It's something like a learning ground. But we have companies who use uh, the startup benefits for 20 years. Uh, think of a uh, uh, big guy in, in swimming trunks who sits uh, by a swimming pool for children and he is shouting, "I'm a." I'm the best, I'm the champion of this uh, pool. Do you want me, uh, uh, hey trainer, do, do you want uh, me to tell you how good you are and I'm still, I'm very old but I'm still the best in this swimming pool. So if, if you are talking about these uh, notions, we need to remember that psychologically Russia is only just entering, uh, entering the understanding and the differentiation between enemy and competitor. Competition is for the whole world competition, and uh, for Russians, competition is anything but competition. If we th think that it's a competition, it means that we have to have rules and we have to have judges. Once you are entering uh, into some business conflict without this understanding, you are not negotiating any longer, you are warring, and we need to teach our youngsters, to teach our children to compete in accordance with rules and to accept the failures. Uh, you fail only because you are a bad entrepreneur, not because you received enough funding. And uh, and thereby I finish, I am very happy to work with Ingrid here. Thank you.
you very much. Appreciate that that feedback. And I think one of the things that uh, you're also going to get out of the presentation this morning is coming from the United States, as I think many of us know, entrepreneurship is very much part of our culture. And it's something when you're an entrepreneur, it's uh, respected and honored. And I think to, to your point, and certainly to a lot of places around the world, this is still an emerging opportunity. And, and how people view entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship as a career, uh, sometimes it's looked at positively and sometimes not so much. And, and we really want to encourage more entrepreneurship globally because as I mentioned yesterday, all of us share this belief that if we're gonna get our global economy turned around, it's not gonna be the Dells of the world that do it. It's gonna be the entrepreneurs and the small business owners who do that. And so in seeing your success and doing our part to help you be successful, that helps all of us. And so with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage, and our format, by the way, is gonna be, uh, our guests are gonna come up, they're gonna spend five to seven minutes or so doing an overview of their background, then I'm gonna do some question and answer with them, and then we're gonna open it up to all of you, okay? All right. So our first guest up today is Andrew Paulson, who is the co-founder of SUP Media. Welcome, Andrew. Good to see you. Here are um, Russian. Please raise your hand. Stoku Vesruski. Oh, okay, super. Um, so I, I guess that many of you know what uh, Afisha was and what uh, Soup was Afisha created with Afisha. We created Afisha magazine, Bolshoi Gorod, Afisha Mir, Yeda. Uh, the point of that company was that unlike all the other media companies at the time, which were getting licenses from Cosmopolitan, Con uh, Hearst, Condé Nast, and so on, we created uh, magazines that were sui generis, that had never really existed elsewhere, that were in Russian, and that we owned the licenses to. Obviously high risk, but high return. Uh, I took an investment of $1 million to start with, and when we sold the company, five years later, we got $30 million for it. Um, a few years later, I created uh, an online media company, which we called Soup, uh, for many different reasons. Uh, and the, the, the first thing that we did was we, we realized that the fourth largest website in uh, Russia actually was Live Journal, Zhivoy Journal. It was the fourth largest website in Russia, but it was actually based in uh, California. So we, we began cobbling together. The theory was that we, would, we, we didn't want to start a small website. We immediately wanted to compete with the very top. We understood that Mail.ru was weak. We understood that Rambler was weak. We understood that Yandex was unbeatable, at least by us. But we, we, our ambition was to start at the top. So we began with uh, acquiring uh, GG. We, we, at, at a time when, when, um, uh, when Yandex was supposedly worth three billion, Rambler two and Mail one, we managed to buy the fourth largest website uh, in Russia for two and a half million dollars. Uh, I then went on to buy Championat, which we bought for two hundred thousand dollars, which is now the number one sports site in Russia, and uh, for reasons that are perhaps beyond me. We then bought uh, Gazeta.ru, um, which uh, unfortunately was, it, it suffered from being a, an old-fashioned paper, uh, newspaper, which had never gone through the phase of being printed on paper. So it had the, it, it had the disadvantages of having a very, very large redaktia without the advantages of actually selling paper copies. But anyway, this, these two companies I've, I've sold, they've been merged, and I believe that they're now the largest online media company in Russia. I think probably, though, I should have come last, not first, in this uh, lineup of speakers because um, one of the things that's essential about being an entrepreneur is thinking in a kind of perverted way, not taking the, the easy road, not doing what's obvious. Um, that's for big companies to do. Uh, the entrepreneur has to do what's not obvious. And so I've been thinking for the last couple of days, how can I do something really not obvious for you all? Uh, so. I realized that one of the things that you've probably been hearing for the last, I was trying to think, what could I possibly tell you that you've not already heard in the last three days? So I'm, I imagine that you've been hearing a lot about how really, really, really important it is to fail. So I decided I was going to give you not just an undergraduate uh, uh, course in failure, but a graduate course in failure. So we're going to talk a little bit about failure. 
and how great failure really is. I'm sure you realize that's a joke. The, the second thing, though, is that um, I was coming down in the, in the elevator today at the hotel, and I was asking some guys what they had learned so far. They were very enthusiastic, and they said, oh, we've learned about persistence. And all of a sudden, I realized there was the, the, the second thing that I wanted to talk a little, about, a little bit about, because persistence and failure go hand in hand, or at least they, they're related in, in a way. I have a friend, uh, <clears throat> or rather an acquaintance, who I met at one of these conferences a year or two ago. And he just graduated, from, well, he had just graduated from Harvard. He'd been in, he, he was a very smart kid and had started a, up a company and needed some more money. So, of course, he came and started asking me for money. And when he realized that I wasn't going to give him any money, because that's not what entrepreneurs do, entrepreneurs take money and maybe give it back, <clears throat> he decided to ask my advice. So he opened up and told me the truth. And the truth was that he'd been out of Harvard five years. He had a really, really, really great idea. He raised, he, he's also very good looking, which is very important for an entrepreneur, unfortunately. Very good looking, he'd managed to raise a good deal of money just out of Harvard for his project, but he'd been screwed by his coders, something that probably anyone here in IT or, or media knows about being screwed by your coders, screwed by your chief uh, information officer, your chief technology officer, your financial director. Basically, his whole team had, had disappointed him. His investors wouldn't let him refinance, but he absolutely believed in this project, this project that, that, that was so, that, 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 had, that had driven him for the last five years. He regretted the fact that he had wasted the five most important years of his life. I consider the last five years of my life the most five most important years of his life. He considered from 20 to 25 the five most important years of his life. <clears throat> but he said, I understand that persistence is the most important quality of an entrepreneur. And I said, yes, persistence is pretty good, but you also have to be right. And if you're persistent and you keep banging your head against a brick wall and banging your head against a brick wall and you keep failing and you're wrong, you're wasting your time. So the real problem is how do you determine when, when things are going well, that's fine. You understand your, your shareholders are, are happy. Well, if your shareholders are Russian, they're never happy. But in general, if your shareholders are happy, are, 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 you know, if they think you're doing okay, they'll be happy. They won't be uh, uh, beating you up. But when things start going wrong, you have to be able to, to, to pass a judgment on yourself. And that's probably psychologically one of the most difficult things for an entrepreneur to do. Because in a way, you have to fool yourself about a lot of things in order to start on any project. In order to take money from people, you have to, you have to be somewhat deluded about your ability to fulfill uh, the res that huge responsibility. So I don't think that there's any secret about how to decide. I can give, I'm going to give you a few little tools and one absolute rule, and then uh, we'll, we'll go on to questions. Basically, and this is maybe something that you've heard already, but basically, in order to have a successful project as an entrepreneur, you need to have five things, and you have to have all five things all at once. You have to have good financial partners and a good team. You need to have a good product at the right time, and you need to have luck. And if you don't have all five of those, probably you're going to stumble. You may, not, they may, not, you, you may be able to cure the problems, but it's just at that moment when you begin stumbling that you need to analyze, are my financial partners the right ones, and what can I do about it if they're not? That's a very difficult problem. Maybe my team, I need to fire everyone and start over. Maybe the product really isn't what I thought it was, or maybe someone else has come up with a similar product. Um, or maybe I'm just too early. Or maybe I just don't have luck. Analyze these, figure out what's wrong, fix it immediately. One of the things that I think uh, all uh, leaders, all CEOs, uh, uh, criticize themselves for above anything else is not firing people early enough, for example. But these are little management um, uh, uh, tricks. But the most important thing is be sure that you understand when you're telling yourself lies and make sure you find time in the day not to tell yourself lies. And understand how much money you have left in the bank and make sure that the, 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 the real moment when you want to, st to pull the plug, when you think you're failing, the real moment you want to pull the plug is when you run out of money. Don't keep going after you've run out of money. Don't get into debt. 
make sure that you preserve your reputation. You preserve your reputation. You make sure that what you, what the advances that you've made, you've secured, because you can always go on and and fight another day. But you can't go on and fight another day if you have debts, and you can't go on and fight another day if your reputation is 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 blemished. So. I realize this is probably the last thing that, that you should be told at the end of a postgraduate course in entrepreneurship, uh, not perhaps the first speaker, but the luck of the draw, I, I came first. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much for sharing all of that. A quick round of applause for hearing your background there. And I couldn't agree more on the debt side. I shared a story yesterday of actually having gone homeless, uh, trying to build one of my companies and losing everything. And it took years to come back from that. So I, I recommend that too. When you're out of money, you're out of money. And uh, preserve your integrity and get back at it as quickly as you can. But Andrew, uh, what I'm curious about is, so you're a guy that went to Yale. And we look at your story, and you seem wildly successful. And what I'm really curious about- I have a very, very good <clears throat> PR uh, team, by the way. <laughs> I talked to them I, beforehand. Yeah, yeah, this is absolutely not true. The reality is very, very different. Well, that's what we want to hear about, is the reality. I mean, you know, for a lot of people, I think, looking at you and your story, it might be tough to relate to it, because you seem very, very successful. So can you take us back? to, first of all, what inspired you to become an entrepreneur? Are you from an entrepreneurial family? Did your family have money that they gave you uh, to start your first, first business? How did that happen? It became very, very clear very quickly that no one would hire me. Oh, it's usually a good reason to uh, go out and start a business. Also, I think, I think that uh, an, another bit of, of, about the psychology of entrepreneurs is that we think that we are uh, pursuing uh, liberty and freedom and independence. We're in fact simply swapping one tyranny for another. We're swapping the tyranny of a 40 hour or 45 hour week being paid a salary for the tyranny of our own obsessions and our own delusions. So it's, we, we're not, when we become entrepreneurs, we're not free. We're just slaves to a different master, ourselves I suppose, which is probably better than being slave to someone else. That's a really good point. Uh, so going back to when you just said nobody would hire you, so let's talk about that for a minute. Why, why is that? Why did you think nobody would hire you? Cause, because clearly you have skills. So what was that? No skills. You're, you're an unskilled person. When I graduated from university, I was specializing in French literary theory. Okay. With the intention of doing what? I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me back in those days. You've got to, this is, this Which is a, was 1981, is, right? We were, we were talking about America recently. And uh, something very interesting happened in 1981. Ronald Reagan became president. And all of a sudden, everyone in America wanted only to make money. When I was growing up, before I finished university, people, when they finished university, this is d ancient history, um, people went into publishing, they win, went into academia, they went into research, they worked for companies like IBM, like AT&T. The entrepreneurs of the pre-Reagan generation were employees. They weren't called entrepreneurs, but they did what entrepreneurs did without any of the upside. They worked at Bell Labs, they worked at Park, they, they worked, most companies had research R&D, research and development departments. So entrepreneurs have always existed, it's simply the financial uh, mechanisms which allowed them to be, become entrepreneurial and do things themselves with their own financing, uh, which came into, a place, into, into place in the 80s. But to go back to Reagan, what happened was that all of the, uh, so much money was flowing into businesses in America in those days, that instead of going into these interesting businesses like publishing or research or, or whatever, um, people started becoming lawyers and bankers. And so all of the best students at Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Columbia would, would, were basically committing what one could call, call intellectual aristocide. All the best and the brightest in America were going into service professions where they were whoring themselves to money. And that's why I left. Uh, I left because I felt that America was, 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 uh, uh, was losing its soul. I realized that's going to fall on very uh, friendly ears in Russia these days. And is this when, when you left, you came over to Russia? No, I uh, stopped off in France for 11 years and was a fashion photographer. <laughs> that's, an that's also an entrepreneurial project because I was trying to sell myself. 
and one can also sell oneself. The problem is that there's no, now to talk a little bit in terms of, 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 of business, when you're selling yourself, there's no equity accumulation. You're only as good as your last photo shoot if you're a photographer. So you don't build any equity value that you can build when you have a company. But it was a, it was a good first course in, um, in selling myself, which you have to do in order to raise money. So your family, though, is in the United States, correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're a guy that was by yourself, because I think there are actually a lot of analogies to where things were in the 80s, to use your example, in the United States, compared to sort of the way that people thought about entrepreneurship there at that time given how the rest of the world thinks about entrepreneurship today. It's still very much evolving. So what I'm curious about, though, is uh, let's, let's stick on why you weren't hireable for a minute, because I think a lot of people talk about entrepreneurs and they say, you got to be somewhat crazy to do this. You can't be hireable. Really, what was behind that? I mean, you're clearly well-educated. So what was it? I think that I think this may actually be uh, one of one. It, it's not a definition of an entrepreneur, but it may be something that one, if you, if one wanted to identify an entrepreneur early, this might be a sign. Uh, I hate doing the same thing twice. Mm -hmm. Did you even know what being an entrepreneur was? Okay. No, in fact, it's very strange. I, I uh, uh, it was only when I finally came to Russia that I thought that. The way you, I had assumed that the way you started a business was you went to your local bank and convinced them uh, to loan you some money to start a, a shoe shop or something. I, I had no idea. This was, the, the, on, on, it, 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 it would be very interesting someday for someone, uh, for example, I think that, the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Harvard Business Review is one of the media sponsors here. It would be so interesting to do a history of entrepreneurship o over the last 40 or 50 years because it's something that what you, what you th think of as entrepreneurship really didn't exist 40 years ago. And it's not because it wasn't ad admired. I think that I, 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 I don't think that there's a problem. I, don't, I think this is a false uh, a straw man or a false uh, argument about uh, getting entrepreneurship to be accepted. I think that entrepreneurs are infinitely sexier, infinitely more interesting, uh, certainly more likely, one, uh, certainly more likely to uh, have success at a bar uh, than non-entrepreneurs. So I think that, that one of the best reasons to become an entrepreneur is it will make you happy. Okay, so, so then just so we've got the linear path that you took. So you grew up in a family that was not entrepreneurial in the United States. You went off to school, realized you were not hireable. You didn't like doing things two times in a row. So you got a wild hair, basically, flew over to France, became a photographer, and you were doing, you went out and you were, was this your own business or did you go work for people? No, I got big clients to pay me to, to do photo shoots uh, for advertising. So you were a freelancer, yeah, so yeah. you became an entrepreneur then. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you didn't know you were an entrepreneur. I, I don't, yes, I was in France and as we know, the French don't have a word for entrepreneur. Okay, so when did you, because then when you were done with that in 11 years and you moved over to Russia and began your formal businesses, when did you feel like you truly became this, what we now know as an entrepreneur? Was it in France? Was it in Russia? Oh, no, no, I'm not. I'm completely lost. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. I, every day you have to reinvent yourself. They're, they're really... We're striving to identify rules, but there are no rules. If there were rules, companies would do that. Mm -hmm. You've got, you, 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 the, the, the trick of being an entrepreneur is finding, if everyone else is looking over here, you look over there. Now, you may be wrong, then maybe there's nothing over there. But you've got, to, you've got to do this day in and day out and day in and day out. It's got to be a habit, but it's a habit for which one never becomes. I mean, one is an entrepreneur only because one has been an entrepreneur. Uh, every day. I mean, for example, I don't want. I, I, I could take another hour talking about the project I'm working on now. Um, and it, Which we'd love. We don't have an hour. We don't have first, an hour. Right. But the reason that I'm thinking of failure and the reason I'm thinking about persistence is that every day I have to try and figure out whether I'm in the process of, of failing or not. Am I succeeding? And uh, it's, a, it's an assessment that. that uh, Everyone has to, or anyone who actually has a company, has a business, you know, I mean, even before you have a business, am I wasting my time going around trying to, uh, trying to raise money for this project? Every banker who I talk to says that I'm wrong, that it's boring, it's stupid, it doesn't have a high enough IRR. Um, I, I, I think that for people of a certain age in Russia, they'll be amused when I tell them that I was trying to raise money for a fiche 
in the spring of 1998, and you'll all remember what happened in August of 1998, and uh, every single investment fund banker I went to talk to in the spring of 1998 said, you're crazy. Your project only has an IRR of 75%. I can buy GKO bonds for 250%. Now, of course, on August uh, 18th, those bonds were worth nothing. And uh, these people hadn't realized that if something is too good, sounds too good to be true, it is. But constantly, you, you're dealing with bankers who probably are not very smart, in my experience. Well, let me ask you this, you've because... To, what... You're constantly being told that what you're doing is wrong, stupid, and not going to go anywhere. And you've got to constantly fight against it or figure out that they're right and, and, and think of something new. Well, Andrew, and I think that's uh, true. I also think it's probably scary for a lot of people to hear. So what you've just said is basically, I'm a guy that doesn't know what I'm doing at any point in time in the day or the year or whatever, and I just have to figure it out every day. So the question is, is so that people don't leave here and go, wow, you really have to be completely out of your mind crazy. You have other speakers. I hope they'll be a little bit more. We're, I'm watching the time. So we're, we're okay on time. But how then do you know when to stop and say, this is an idea I need to pursue? How do you know that? Because it sounds like, and I don't know if you use this term over here, but a lot of entrepreneurs have ADHD. Do you have that term in Russia? Lots of running thoughts through your mind. And you sound like a guy that probably has this. So when do you know, and maybe I'm wrong, but how do you know when to stop and say, this is an idea I'm going to go pursue? It's the same way, I suppose, you, you find a life partner. Uh, you meet lots and lots and lots of people. It's and a gut feeling. It's a, yeah, it's a gut feeling. And I think that's a really good point, too, because uh, a lot of successful, some of the most successful entrepreneurs I know, they followed an intuitive feeling. Because you, well, you can't just be listening to other people's advice because other people... Uh, other people aren't you, and, and uh, you should listen to other people's advice, but it's not, uh, it, it's not going to really give you the, the, the path, I think. So then let me transition for a moment then to, because you talked about the process of raising money. And I know in the United States, you know, for example, I'm an investor there and I have businesses I fund. Before I go and ask for money, I have to put my own money in and actually feel like this is going to go somewhere. You've made some money in your businesses. Um, do you do the same thing over here before you go and ask for money? Well, my, my history in, in, in Russia of my various partners has been uh, strange. Um, I had one partner uh, who, I, I, I'm not telling any secrets, it's already in, been in the press. I had one partner who I went out to dinner with. We got into a fight. We almost beat each other up at dinner. We made up. We, we, we met a couple of times. And I was playing very cool because I, I didn't want to seem too eager for his money. And finally, he said, so are you going to run this project or not? And I said, what project? And, and he said, look, I want you to run this project we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. And I said, well, well what, what sort of money are you thinking of? And he said, look, I'll give you 20 million, and if you spend it well, I'll give you another 20 million, and if you spend it well, I'll give you another 20 million. I don't think any of you should wait, should be holding your breath for that kind of a meeting. Right. Well then, uh, because I want to leave time for the audience to ask you questions. So given you're the crazy person of the group, so what do you think, so that guy that just said, I'll give you 20 million, 20 million, 20 million, what has been the critical element to your personal success, in your opinion? <clears throat> you mentioned the five qualities, but for, for you personally, what, it, what is it? Why are you the guy that we're going to give $20 million to? Okay, well, it's different. I, I don't know why he gave me the money, um, and, but I can say that, that and, and I also don't think that the solution, the, the answer I can give you is perhaps not even a good answer for today, but it was a good answer for Russia uh, in 1990. 1997, even before I, I was doing some similar projects. The answer was, as long as you work hard and you're honest and you're smart, in Russia, you'll win. Now, I don't know if that's a universal truth, but that's the truth I followed. Yeah. I decided, strangely, I, with, with Afisha, for example, Afisha, for those of you who are, who are not Russian, Afisha was a magazine sort of like Time Out, but it was a magazine like Time Out in a world where there was no New York Times Sunday magazine supplement. There were no other magazines about culture. There were no other magazines telling you how to appreciate uh, a restaurant or, or an art exhibition. 
and it was the easiest place in the world for journalists to get kickbacks. To, to you know, you go to a restaurant, you eat, you get a free meal. They give slip you a hundred dollars, and you write a good, a good uh, uh, review. But I decided that that it was far more profitable to pay the journalists well, and let them make mistakes. At least they weren't being paid to make mistakes. They made mistakes because they were young, but they were young and honest. And we made advertising through, we made money through advertising because the advertisers trusted the magazine. So it was, it was, it was a situation where being honest and hardworking actually paid off. It wasn't a sacrifice. In fact, it was a, a heathy business decision. Hmm. Andrew, thank you so much. I want to open it up for some questions from the audience now. We've, nice, thank you. I have so many more questions I can ask you, uh, but I do like these key takeaways that you don't need to have grown up in an, an, an entrepreneurial family nor have the education. Really is about a gut feel and really honor your integrity, be honest, work hard, and all of these pieces come together to help, in your case, uh, make you a successful entrepreneur. So who's got some questions in the audience that you'd like to ask Andrew? <clears throat> Here we go, right over here. Hello, my name is Elena Lidovskaya. I'm from Krasnoyarska uh, region. So I'm now uh, studying uh, uh, in the postgraduate studies and uh, I study the business psychology. So I'm, I'm very interested in studying the business psychology in Russia. And uh, I do business myself. I have my uh, small hotel. I do hunting, I do fishing and uh, I'm met people who have all the prerequisite, all the way a weasel to become, uh, uh, to, to, to have their own business. They don't do business. They prefer to, because they have the status education, but they prefer to be a top manager. And they sit back and get bored. And I ask her, why don't you want to open your own business? You have everything to start your business. You have everything for that. And I came across so many people in Russia, I believe that uh, you all agree with me, who have nothing, including myself. I started from scratch, having in my pocket 30,000 rubles. My husband called me insane when I uh, spoke to him about the business plan. But for the last nine years, I have been successful and I met so many people without any education no money nothing just perseverance as you told assertiveness they have this crazy drive this idea I don't know even how to call it this this roach in their head you know this bug in the head and they prosper and I have so many friends like that how can you explain that that for every entrepreneur, there's a, a new and different story. I don't think that there's a, a, a unified field theory of entrepreneurship. Uh, my favorite, uh, well, not my favorite, but an example that came to mind as you were talking was uh, a friend of mine who uh, created a company in Moscow called uh, Arba Prestige, which was worth a couple of billion dollars before it was worth nothing. Um, but his training, his upbringing, his preparation for creating the largest cosmetics uh, retail uh, organization in, in, in Russia, feared by L'Oreal, feared by L'Etoile. He was really, he had, I don't know, 90% of the market. He basically started off transporting pickles to Crimea. He had trucks that were going back and forth with Ag Agurtsi, uh, to uh, to Crimea. So, uh, in Russia is a, Russia is an example. In, in Russia, you have you have a whole different uh, as the phrase that's been being used. You have a whole different ecosphere ecosystem, and uh, yeah, find your niche in the ecosystem. Some people want to create huge companies. Some people are very happy with small companies that have regular income that they own, but that are not, that don't have any equity value that they're not going to do IPOs for and so on. I mean, I don't see any problem having a company that makes uh, enough money so that you and your family can live perfectly well. It's like owning a, a shop, a street corner shop. There's nothing wrong with that. Unless the only problem with owning a, a, a corner uh, uh, producti is when the large supermarkets come in and, uh, and then you, you're screwed. Okay, do we have time? Yep, question right over here. Um, they're bringing the mic over to you. Здравствуйте. 
Меня зовут Валерий. Hi, my name is Valeri. I'm a starting entrepreneur. I can see many young people in the room. And uh, my question, could you please tell me what are the words that you were saying to yourself when you're starting your business that woke you up in the morning? Fear, absolutely. Fear of failure. Fear of failure is the, is the, is, is, is such a great generator of adrenaline. And it's funny, I was just, uh, yesterday I arrived at the Metropole by taxi. It's the first time I've ever arrived at the Metropole by taxi. The Metropole used to be my office in 1993. It was the only, there were, perhaps you don't remember, but in 1993 there were no mobile phones. And uh, I don't even think there were pagers. Uh, I woke up every morning, ran to the Metropole to get in front of a telephone that I could make telephone calls at so that I could make appointments to go see people in the afternoons. Terror, terror is the best uh, uh, thing to wake, that gets you up in the morning. Hey, we have a question in the back over here. We have time for one or two more questions. It's a great question, and Elena, I can't wait to get you up here, young entrepreneur. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm starting uh, starting entrepreneur. Could you please tell me what uh, moves you? What do you want when you do business? What's your, is it a wish to make money or to get something? This again is 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 a way in which I don't think that I'm in the least bit typical. I, I I'm only I'm only interested in amusing myself. <laughs> That's why I want to make money so that I can keep amusing myself. But uh, I always, I only choose businesses that are interesting. I only choose businesses that 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 are beautiful. And I think uh, I, I I think that we will all agree uh, that uh, Russia is. Uh, and this is a very I shouldn't even say this, but I'm very 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 proud to have come to Russia in 1993 and created Afisha and Bolshogorod and uh, have and have had the uh, the wit to put the servers for GGG in Montana. Got a question right here. Right there, this, are, this, this will be our last question right there. <clears throat> hey, Andrew, while they're bringing the mic over there, you talk about uh, the money piece of it and you don't really worry about that. As an adult, I mean, when you run out of money, it's a scary thing. And have you ever been broke as an adult? How when, old when I, were you when you so, were last broke? Well, <laughs> let's see how much money. And let's see if he tells the uh, real answer. <laughs> yeah, but it's important. No, it's very funny. I, I just a very quick anecdote. Um, I had been uh, looking to try to raise money for Afisha for a long time, um, and I had run out of money. And I had one last interview with a lunatic a lunatic, sadomasochistic investment banker at Renaissance Capital. He was the head of investment uh, of, of equity trading and he had never held a stock for more than eight hours. He was all about fast buying and selling. And, 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 and also, if for any of you who know the, 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 the business ethos of Renaissance Capital, he was not only a sadist, he was not a masochist, he was a sadist. He was, he was, he was brutal and mean and devious and vicious. And uh, this was my last chance. I had no more money in the bank. And he even noticed, he told me uh, years later, we we're now very good friends, he uh, just resigned a, a couple of months ago as CEO of uh, Beeline in Russia. Um, he, he told me uh, a, a couple of months later after we'd, begun, after we'd begun making money that he had noticed that my shirt collars were frayed and that's why he only gave me 15%, not 20% of the sweat equity. So be careful about your shirts. Don't give off little tells that you're desperate when you're looking for money. But it worked. It was my last meeting. It was my last meeting. I would have had to go back and live with my mother in America. And, uh, you know, humiliation. That was the fear that, that made that meeting work. Desperation. Thank you for sharing. Then we have this one last question. I believe you've got the mic. The mic? Oh, you've got it. Okay, please. Hello. Uh, uh, so, dear colleague, I want to ask a question. We have here starting entrepreneurs in the room and entrepreneurs who are quite uh, mature and well-to-do during globalization. What do you think about the global international cooperation of businesses on specific topic? That is, 
uh, is it important because you said you did business in Russia in Russia very good products and high tech and what do you think what's your take on global international cooperation so that in different countries uh, entrepreneurs uh, would uh, join forces uh, on mutually beneficial uh, terms uh, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that um, in general entrepreneurs in Russia tend to think about a business in Russia. Um, I think we've seen, for example, that there, there used to be a business magazine uh, which sort of brought together Eastern Europe and Russia, and it just didn't work because people were either interested in Poland or Czechoslovakia or Romania or Russia. So, but there are exceptions, and I think one of the exceptions for a young entrepreneur can be obviously an internet company. Uh, it's very, very easy to, uh, well, if you have a successful product, the, the difficulty is not leaping across uh, national bo uh, national borders. So I think that inter an international internet product is probably the only thing that a, a young startup entrepreneur can hope to, uh, to do. Thank you very much, Andrew. Again, round of applause. Thank you. Well, now back to your question. You were talking, well, a couple of people have referred to younger entrepreneurs, and I am honored to have our next guest up here, Alana Mazalova. And if I'm saying these names wrong, please forgive me. Chief Executive Officer. She's the founder of Educen. She's made more than $130 million. Welcome, Alana. She's going to give us an overview of her background, and then we'll go into Q&A. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a quick question before we begin. Who is from Russia here, actually? Can you? OK, I think it's like uh, two thirds of the audience. Great, great. Um, I will just quickly go through the presentation. So a few words about. Um, a few words about my background. So um, you probably know me because I co-founded Dabri and we sold it to Groupon in 2000, 2010. So uh, Groupon was the fastest growing company ever. It reached $1 billion in sales faster than Google, faster than Amazon and to all other internet companies. Uh, before that, I, uh, I founded AdVenture. That was the first Russian seed fund ever. So we invested small money, uh, seed money, uh, $30,000, $40,000 into internet companies. Uh, the most successful uh, out of those companies uh, was uh, and still is Pixonic, which is a mobile, it was first social gaming uh, company, now it's a mobile gaming company. It has 30, 30 million players worldwide uh, in uh, South Korea, in England, uh, US, uh, Brazil, etc., etc. So we sold two of those companies. Uh, in sales, uh, we sold it to Naspers and W we sold to Groupon. Uh, and my company is actually, uh, you said that I made 130 million, it's, it's from my, my company is uh, earned that much while I was top manager of them. Um, th those companies were running in 33 cities, we had almost 1,000 employees, uh, raised some money, uh, well, had lots of uh, visits, etc. Right now I'm focused on Edison, and I will talk about this uh, later. So uh, the topic for uh, the topic for, uh, for our uh, panel is what makes entrepreneurs successful, and are there some secrets? I think you all know that um, it, it's common knowledge that um, intellect matters, IQ, your qualities matter, your EQ, uh, and also your persistence matter. And here I would argue with uh, Andrew, so I will talk about this. Um, if you ask me to choose one uh, one quality, I would probably uh, say that this is uh, sales skills. Your ability, your uh, ability as an entrepreneur to convince people, not only your investors, not only your clients, not only your business partners, but also your um, your employees. Because if you're running out of money, you're having troubles, you need to persuade them that just guys, things are going to be okay. Just trust me, s stay with the company. You need to be uh, convincing people from like companies like McKinsey to uh, convince them to leave the company 
company and come to your risky uh, startup when nothing is known and th their salary will be four times smaller. So you need to have vision and passion and convince people. So if you ask me for one quality, I will say this is this. So just uh, ability to understand people, to uh, what mo understand what motivates them and uh, convince them. Uh, then I would argue that uh, being aggressive, being persistent, being pushy, uh, never taking no for an answer also matters. Uh, of course, you need um, there, there are limits to this. You need to know when when to stop, when to uh, uh, modify your business model, when to make changes. I will talk about about this. Uh, and finally, it's just uh, your intellect because you can't just be um, uh, no. Pr probably you can become a small level uh, a small level successful entrepreneur if you you're not smart enough. But uh, in order to be a, um, a billionaire, you need to read lots of analytics, uh, constantly analyze what your competitors are doing, uh, gather the intel, and uh, analyze this information and ch change change your business model, change the course of actions. Okay, just a few examples uh, about uh, about persistence. Um, just let's look at this case. Uh, I think that, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, successful, the most persistent, driven entrepreneurs were Zambo brothers. There are three uh, German uh, entrepreneurs brothers uh, who uh, co-founded European Groupon and sold it to Groupon, who co-founded European uh, Zappos. Uh, no, it's called Zalando. Uh, they have more than 150 companies. And basically what to do is they found a successful business model and then they replicate this business model in uh, different markets. So in, in Russia, this Zappos clone is La Moda, and it's now the leader in its niche. Uh, in uh, Brazil, it's uh, Zalora, etc., etc. So they just uh, make it. And they're super driven, uh, super persistent. And now um, I, uh, I'm telling you about one case. So it was uh, Wednesday late evening uh, and Mark Zamwer uh, was with a visit to um, Rus Russian group on office and um, the goal which was set to us to our team was just guys uh, let's hire two new uh, human resources managers I want them Friday morning just do whatever you want just Friday morning those 10 new people shall, shall be in it seems like mission impossible because actually it's, it's late in the evening you have one day to um, just uh, write uh, whatever, write this um, advertising about your position, your job opening, have one day to call those people, uh, invite them to the interview, ch uh, choose 10 people, then they, uh, usually in Russia it takes two weeks uh, to leave your previous job. So actually it seems like mission impossible because we had uh, basically 24 hours. But um, I think what differentiates successful entrepreneurs is that they are always looking for solutions and they're always creative. In this particular case, this is probably not the best solution ever, but that was the best solution in those, um, in those, uh, with those resources which we had in those constraints. So we decided that temporarily we would just take people from other departments and fill those positions. Like we had a guy in, uh, in support who was good in making calls, and we would take this guy and he'll make calls to uh, to the people and invite them to the interviews, or just conduct uh, those job interviews via phone. We would take another guy, and uh, really Friday morning we had two new people who started fulfilling this job and making things done so in this uh, with those resources we had that was the best solution uh, another example about changing your business model and about iterating is probably uh, the case with Edison uh, quite soon uh, the idea is with Edison is that we uh, come to Howard Stanford and other elite business schools and usually you have to pay them like $150,000 and spend two years of your life to get the degree there uh, our solution is that we make video lectures with those professors and sell them for like $99. So really, for the much cheaper, uh, for the um, much lower price, you get the same level, uh, the same level of uh, quality education. Very soon, we uh, when we started approaching schools, we understood that elite schools are quite hard to convince. Uh, NCAD gathered a committee of 40 people, really 40 people.
people in the room. Uh, and it took them two months to get this committee. Then they just set some uh, set some uh, milestones. And we understood that it, it is going to take about, I don't know, one year and probably we will still not going to be successful. So very fast we decided that we will change this approach. And we uh, will just approach teachers directly, especially adjunct professors. Because adjunct professors don't have this limitation in their contract that um, they, are, uh, they need to go to the dean and ask for permission whether they can do this online project or not. So this was just uh, a very fast decision, uh, quick decision, and it worked out. Um, I also advise you to look at the um, you know, patterns how other entrepreneurs uh, were, uh, were making such dec decisions. Uh, we have a free course on Edison lessons from billionaires where uh, people like Warren Buffett, uh, Bill Gates, uh, and lots of artists talk, talk about the, uh, uh, their decision, decisions they make, and it, it's really helpful. So I advise to, uh, to watch. Then uh, about uh, persistence. So. Uh, Um, if there is, uh, if, if you ask me, to, uh, if you ask me about some tips about how to make your company successful, uh, I think it all comes down to two, uh, two pieces of advice. One is very quickly iterate, change your business model. Don't sit isolated in the ivory tower and try building some perfect product. It just doesn't exist. And most importantly, you don't know what it is. You need to go to your clients, approach your potential clients, even when you don't have a product. Probably you just have uh, a one-page description and some fake uh, screenshots, fake mock-ups of the product, which doesn't exist yet. But even at this stage, um, approach, approach your clients, talk to them. What, uh, they, they will tell you about the features in the product they want. And this advice will be much more helpful than just sitting isolated and trying to build the, prof uh, the perfect product. Uh, very quickly iterate. If you see that this thing is not working, just change it. Uh, try making those uh, changes fast and cheap. Uh, the second thing is just uh, focus on um, focus on one key activity. Do not try everything. Do not try to enter all the markets. Like uh, we often hear from uh, young entrepreneurs uh, that uh, my company will be global. I will launch in in Brazil, in Korea. Already, I already have the uh, Chinese domain, etc., etc. It doesn't work. Just focus on one key key thing, one one niche, uh, one market, uh, one killer feature, which. Um, which your users will like. And usually this, this thing, this area of focus is your product. You need to build first, uh, you need to build something so wonderful, so, uh, so valuable that the clients will love to pay you money. So they will love this product and they will want this badly. So focus on this first. This is much more important than running for investors or just, uh, well, focusing on the team. Um, I can tell you uh, that this worked with Edison too, because our uh, first uh, uh, hypothesis was that uh, we will go to uh, B2C clients, just individuals like you, uh, and we will offer them those MBA, uh, MBA courses, uh, and we will focus on BRIC countries, so R Russia, Brazil, etc. But um, as we conducted 200... Uh, okay, I will, ju I will just... Uh, as we conducted 200 client interviews and as we analyzed reports and data, we understood that our corporate market is so much more interesting for us. That was the first takeaway. Second, that uh, people do not want some strategy course or uh, they want skills, presentation skills, sales skills, so something specific when, uh, which they can use uh, tomorrow uh, when they come, to, uh, come to, uh, to the office. So something very specific. Uh, and second, we uh, thirdly, we understood that uh, U.S. market is so much larger, so we need to, to focus there. Uh, what helped us? It was new external data. If we sit just in our office and try to imagine things, it would never work out. But we talked to our clients and we read analytics. Uh, corporate education field is 142 billion. This is 10 times larger than Hollywood, seriously. Those movie blockbusters are 14 billion uh, dollar market size. And corporate education is 10 times larger. When we saw this, we understood that, come on, just forget B2C, focus on and corporate clients. So that, that was uh, the idea. Great. Great. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
Okay. So, Lana, I'm, and, uh, I'm only going to ask you a few questions so that we uh, stay on track and, and get everybody out of here on time, and we've got one more, more guest. Um, but what fascinates me about you and your story is that you're a young entrepreneur and you're a young woman entrepreneur. And so I'm curious from your perspective, first of all, who taught you to be an entrepreneur? How did you learn this? And how would you say your experience of being an entrepreneur, a woman versus a guy, uh, what, what has been your experience? Has it been harder, easier? Please share some of that. First, who, who taught you what you know? Um, well, first, uh, since I remember myself, I think since the age of seven, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Not to work in some company, but to build some company. Maybe because my father was in 1992, uh, when the economical changes started, he also founded his company. So I always saw him as an example. Uh, maybe because our school was specific. We had economics lessons since we were children. So we, we really uh, learned something about business. Uh, I don't know. So it just it, it came natural. It's it, uh, it's uh, building companies, starting new pr projects is uh, what I love, love doing. Actually, I would pay to get my job uh, done, not not get paid. So. And as for your second question about um, women entrepreneurs, first, I don't think, uh, I always hate those questions because I don't think uh, women entrepreneurs are any different. So probably um, uh, probably uh, less percentage of women are, uh, women are aggressive and it matters in business. Fortunately or unfortunately, you need to show passion. You, uh, to, you need to, during negotiations, push, uh, pu pu just push your partner sometimes. Um, but uh, all the rest is the same. So you need to make smart decisions you need to listen to people and hear women are much uh, are much better to, you need to un feel the person understand what the person really is afraid of wants um, all the rest is the same so I agree with you on the women front, by the way, but it is a question that comes up all the time. And factually speaking, there just simply aren't as many women building the companies as the guys. So let me, let me ask you this then. Did it ever cross your mind, given it sounds like you were just born with this innate interest to become an entrepreneur, did it ever cross your mind to go and get a job? No, actually, I worked in consulting for like uh, five months. Uh, that was very helpful. So I learned a lot. Um, I learned to analyze data, to give presentations, to, to actually to make uh, beautiful slides, uh, not, not like this. Um, but uh, in the end, the result, uh, in the end of the day, the result we had was just the uh, pack of slides. It was not really the change. It was not the job done because we didn't see this. We just gave it to the client and then we hope that they will make, make those changes which we advised. So uh, it didn't feel like something valuable. When you're an entrepreneur, you are making changes every day. So you see this change and you manage it. So it's much more interesting for me. So when you first started out then, uh, given you worked for five months and most people would, you know, Become entrepreneurs actually do have jobs for an extended period of time. So um, that's really not a lot of time to actually even put money in a bank account mm -hmm. to support you while you're an entrepreneur. So did you actually have money when you were starting out? Did your family give you money or did you really start out really kind of with not a lot and you just figured it out? Uh, well, first, Russia is such a specific uh, country when you usually um, get a job well, well you, while you are a second or third year student, just it, it happens. So. so I was also a student at this time when I worked in consulting and when I launched my first company, I, I was a student. Uh, so I, I lived with my parents, so I didn't need, I didn't need money for living. But uh, as for the business, usually we bootstrapped. So we try to make everything very, uh, very cheap uh, to ask our friends uh, wherever possible. And and my first business uh, was um, Smart Kniga. Those were short summaries of business books, which uh, we sold to corporations. And we got our first clients really fast. So it helped us. Actually, the clients financed the business. Not uh, We didn't need to uh, loan money or anything. So it, it was helpful. It, it, how did you get access to those corporations? I mean, did you have? We just called them. It was just call calling. Did it ever cross your mind that you, that you might fail? Did it ever cross your mind? Or did you just say, ah, I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to do it? Uh, no, because uh, I mean, we'll, we'll just, we would have just launched another project and yet another project. I participated in more than 20 companies. Uh, I think 10, roughly 10 as investor and roughly 10 as entrepreneur. It's just normal. You just launch another company. As for next companies, um, you did, by the way, see that this is not 
normal, right? Of course. Okay. Most people. I just want to make that clear. Okay. Most people really fear fear failure. Uh, as for adventure, we raised uh, that was a fund, but um, instead of uh, normal LPs, uh, we went to other successful entrepreneurs who didn't have expertise in IT and they wanted to invest in IT. So we raised money from them. Uh, Pixony got venture funding, uh, Groupon got venture funding because uh, the market in Russia developed and uh, such funds started to appear on the market. So. It, it, uh, we could talk all day about this. I did get a sign. I just want to make sure. Can I take some questions from the audience? Yep. Okay. We're going to jump to that so that we can keep on schedule. Fascinating, though. Thank you. Uh, I believe you are a good businesswoman, but why do you think you are a good entrepreneur? I see a lot of companies who were adopted maybe from, uh, you know, overseas or Europe. And the second question is: If I was to invite you to a lunch, would you allow me to pay for the? dinner or you would you split the check thank you <laughs> that sounds like a dating question but that's another topic <laughs> uh, about the second question first I uh, uh, if the person pays I always accept it I think it's normal if just the men are so stupid that they would be okay fine I'm, I'm fine with this uh, as for the first question um, we love the men by the way we, we do recognize that to be a successful woman entrepreneur we need the guys to <laughs> you know, join this journey with us and be successful with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first question, actually, it was about uh, clones, um, because uh, uh, at least half of the businesses uh, which I invested or founded were uh, cloned business models. So there was already something successful in the US, usually, and we just replicated the business model here. Um, uh, answering the question, first, I think this is still entrepreneurship, because it is uh, a mistake that you can just look at something and immediately Digitally replicated uh, on in the next day. It doesn't work this way. You need to. Uh, there are lots of peculiarities of the local market. You need to uh, accept them. As for Groupon, for example, there were like 50 companies on the market, uh, and we were number one. Our second competitor had 10 times more money than we did, and we were. Uh, our market share was twi uh, twice as big as their market share. So we were 20 times more efficient. So yes, the answer to your question is I believe we are. Good we were a good team of entrepreneurs. And second, my, um, uh, the second answer is that my um, philosophy really changed because right now I'm not doing cloned companies. Edison is a unique business model. No, but no one in the world right now is doing corporate education online like, like, like we are doing it. Um, the reasons for, there are two reasons for that. First, uh, Russian uh, market share in almost uh, all of the markets is two, uh, two to three percent of the world. Uh, market share. So if you are making um, games, for example, like Pick Sonic or selling virtual goods or like uh, our, our courses are actually virtual, you can access them from all over the world, it makes a lot of sense to launch a global company uh, because your product uh, can be accessed from anywhere in the world. It can't be done if you're having uh, like some uh, e-commerce business because then the delivery is local, etc. But for so many businesses, it makes sense and do it because the market is uh, 30 to 50 times large and that's what I'm doing right now so okay we'll take one more question and then we need to back in the back right here I have a question a oh, a okay right. question, actually. Uh, how do you think think what is uh, more important in business uh, skills technologies or uh, soft uh, sort of entrepreneurs uh, spirit passion probably um, I think it's always a mix because I have seen uh, lots of uh, driven entrepreneurs who uh, didn't have the right city or person or the uh, the idea they were they were working on um, w wasn't uh, wasn't going to be a success. So it's always a mix: a good a good team and uh, a good leader and the good technology. I don't think you can name any billion-dollar size company, any successful company, which lacked any any of those. And even if they did, they very uh, they were fast uh, imp improved this. Probably the investors advised them or anything. So, okay. And we have one final question in the back. I, I have a question on self-awareness. And if you had to summarize, what is that one thing that's enabled you as an entrepreneur in terms of your own personality or characteristics? And also, what is that one thing that derails you constantly? And how do you manage that? that actually can I please you? can I please repeat because I didn't yeah. understand. So what is that one thing uh -huh. in terms of your personality or characteristics that drives you as an entrepreneur? 
but also what is that one thing that you know stops you and how do you manage that the weakness as a as in terms of your personality or characteristic well, uh, what drives me is uh, change and achievement, and it's not achievement is not necessarily measured in money. It can be measured in uh, users or the product which uh, which our clients love. So we're just making something new, and every day he's in your every week he's in you uh, you go. So for me, I always like to measure uh, uh, what what we achieve. As for as for the limits, I don't know, probably lack of focus for me. So um, as you could see on the graph, there were lots of companies uh, with which I was involved. And uh, just at some stage, you need to focus on the one which is performing the best and try to spend almost all of your time there and uh, in invest your time there. So. OK, and I think we need to move on to our final speaker. Thank you very much, Alana. And finally, and we're, we're just so you all know, we're going to run a few minutes over. So does that work for most everyone? We've got some great conversations going here. Uh, we'll, we'll get you out of here by 10 after 12 at the latest. So our final speaker is Dani Johnson. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Call to Freedom International. Welcome to the stage. Good to see you. So we'll start with, the, you'll share with us your story. Well, my name is Danny Johnson, and um, I am so not like these two who are just up here. <laughs> it's an honor to be here, and especially seeing so many young people. It's very encouraging to me. I grew up in a very poor family. Um, uh, my parents were welfare recipients. They were drug addicts, and they were violently abusive in every way. I was emotionally, mentally, physically tormented by a man that was six foot ten, 350 pounds. I was also sexually abused from the time I was three until I was 16. When you grow up like me, you don't make great choices. The environment that I lived in was absolutely toxic. My sisters and I, all my mom, my sisters and I were all badly abused on a weekly, sometimes daily basis. I was not smart through school. I could not read any books. I made it all the way through high school without ever reading a book. I read my first book when I was 21 years old. I was told I was stupid, fat, and ugly my entire life. So I was not a confident person. I was not a person with vision. My biggest dream was to get married to a man that wouldn't beat me. That was my biggest goal, my biggest vision in life. At 19, 17, I ended up pregnant out of high school. And in where I grew up, that was very harshly judged, criticized, and condemned, especially by the religious people. At 19, something changed in my life. I met entrepreneurs for the very first time. I was so dense and stupid that I didn't know that normal people started businesses. I, I, in my mind, I thought it was only people like Ms. Vanderbilt here or like Paul, that it was the brilliant, smart, good-looking people that went to Yale and Harvard and knew all the right people in all the right places. And I just knew that I would never succeed at anything. So when I first met these entrepreneurs, they kind of planted some seeds inside of me, some phrases that changed the way I thought. And I didn't get started in business at 19 because I thought I could succeed. I got started in business at 19 because I knew I could fail. On a failure equation, as I saw several millionaires, there were four that were in a room, kind of similar to this. Hearing their stories inspired me. And when I heard, when I counted up what they were making, I thought to myself, I know I'm the dumbest person in this room. And if it takes me 20 years to figure out what they know, if it takes me 20 years to learn from them how they are able to do this, and if I fail their income by 90%, I'll be making $100,000 a year and I will never do that working at the mall. So on a simple failure equation, I started in business. My first six months, I failed miserably. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand any of what most of you already understand. At, uh, after six months, I had a young man come to me and uh, he was a competitor, actually, and he was four years older. He was like these two. 
He had the education. He was good looking. He, was, he knew the right people. But for some reason, I begged him, please teach me how to crawl, walk, then run. I know nothing about business. I know nothing about success. He gave me four things that I want to talk to you about today. These four things dramatically changed my life. I still live according to these four things, and these four things are some of the opposite things that you heard these two very brilliant, very successful people tell you. But these four things has helped me to help tens of thousands of entrepreneurs to succeed because that's what I do professionally. From there, I had uh, six months of success. After six months of failure, I made $50,000, which was a lot of money to a 20-year-old kid uh, that was never going to make $50,000 in six months. Then I met and married a guy that I knew for seven days. I destroyed my life. Again, my past rising up to haunt me, bad choices. I ended up homeless. After four months of marriage, I met and married a guy that I knew for seven days. Dumb. I ended up homeless at the age of 21, embezzled. One of the millionaires that taught me how to understand business stole the business. Um, great, wonderful failure. $2.03 to my name, a $35,000 debt, 50 pounds overweight, and complete failure. Suicidal, doing drugs, sleeping around with anyone that would have me. I almost became a prostitute for food. It was a disaster. But I heard a voice on Christmas Day tell me to pick up my mat and walk, and I did. I started a business from the trunk of my car at a payphone booth the very next day, and I made $2,000 profit with nothing. No product, <laughs> no brochures, no receipts, no business cards, bad reputation. I, there, you could not have a worse reputation than what I had in this little town of 5,000 people. So a product that I didn't like, that I didn't believe in, that I didn't think would work, but it was the only thing that was gonna help me get out of being homeless. I was working as a cocktail waitress part-time and get me into an apartment. So my first year in business, I made a quarter of a million dollars. By the end of my second year, I became a millionaire for the first time. Today, I'm a multi-millionaire. I own several companies. I'm a mother of five, grandmother of five. Uh, I travel around the world speaking and training up entrepreneurs. We have a publishing company. We publish adult education materials that have also helped kids become entrepreneurs and make money when adults can't, turning over tens of thousands of dollars a year. I've got 12-year-olds making cash, learning how to be entrepreneurs. Um, I've also been, the, I've had the craziest life. Today I'm a international speaker, an international best-selling author. Uh, I'm a radio and television show host as well. Uh, and I have a passion for feeding orphans. I feed tens of thousands of orphans every single month. I am not motivated by a dime. I am motivated by two things, helping to raise people up that come from nothing and rise up to something great and using their lives to become better than anything they ever came from. And then we take the portion of the profits and we feed tens of thousands of kids from all over the world. We help to free kids out of the sex trade. We help to build homes for the poor. I am passionate about seeing people's lives change and using our lives to benefit the lives of those that are around us and abroad. Woo! That was awesome. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm just gonna ask a couple questions here because I know you've got a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah Danny, what, what are the ones? Things? Number one, the young man told me that if I gave him one excuse, he would not work with me. Excuses are well-planned lies. We can come up with a thousand of them, and I had a thousand of them. I'm a woman. No one's going to listen to me. I am not educated. No one's going to listen to me. I'm stupid. I'm fat. I'm ugly. No one's going to listen to me. I had all those tapes playing in my head that my father had programmed me with, and I believed 100% of them. So when he told me I couldn't give him any excuses, he kind of created, and it's really interesting how, he, how everyone else said some, so many different things. But I gotta tell you, I've worked with hundreds of thousands of people, and these four things have changed so many people's lives. Excuses will keep you broke for the rest of your life. They limit you, they stop you. When you choose to put your focus on excuses, you're wasting time, and it creates fear. You ha it's faster to create results than it is to follow your excuses. So excuses, no excuses. 
Come hell or high water, buddy, you can make it if you make a decision two. And number two, he said, don't give me any of your opinions and no suggestions. Your opinions are worth broke. Your opinions and your suggestions are worth what you make. And if you listen to your opinions and suggestions, you're going to be broke because that's what they're producing right now. So learn from successful people. Oh my gosh, this was massive for me. Learn from successful people. If you want to become a millionaire, you've got to learn from millionaires. You got to be teachable. Follow directions was number three. And that was like the greatest thing. First of all, don't have any opinions and suggestions. That was huge because when you are an insecure person, guess what you have a lot of? Opinions and suggestions. You want to fool everybody into thinking that you're smarter than you are. So that gave me kind of, I don't know, I want to call it a prison, but it gave me no wiggle room that I had to shut up and listen. Take notes. Study people who have what you want and do what they tell you to do. So that third one of following directions, he said, if you change anything I tell you to do, I will not work with you. And number four is invest in yourself. There's lots of investments you can make in the world. You can invest into stocks. You have no control over the value of that dollar. You can invest into real estate. I've made millions of dollars in real estate. You can't control that market either, but you can put sweat labor in there. And if you learn new skills about these different industries, you can become very successful. And number three is the only investment that my husband and I have made. And by the way, my husband grew up like I did. He grew up on the streets, had his first business at eight years old, provided for his mother, okay? Bad, bad childhood my husband had as well. That, that fourth thing of investing into yourself. There's only one investment that we've made for 25 years and we continue to do so. And that's the investment we make in ourselves, into our skill set, into the mindset, into growing and learning and producing better skills of working with people. These things have never returned void for us. They have helped us to make millions upon millions of dollars. The more we grow, the more our finances grow and the more our influence grows to the tune now that my name and face have been seen in by millions of people in hundreds of companies, I mean countries. Give me a break. I was a homeless chick. Anything is possible with these four things. Let's just keep going with questions from the audience because I know we're short on time and we have a lot of questions. Okay. Let me take, uh, we're going to take two questions and then go to a final wrap up. So questions from the audience? I saw a hand raised. Questions, questions? None? There. Oh, there we go. One in the back. And then we have one in the front. Uh, oh. uh, you, were, you were saying that 18, uh, 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 you thought you were overweight, that you thought you were stupid, and that, and that you will never be able just to become rich and prosperous. So what made you go? And so what was the starting point? What got the ball rolling? Hungry. I was a homeless woman. Food? <laughs> I was a homeless woman. I became worse than my parents. And that was something I said I would never do. I never wanted to be like my mom and dad. But that wasn't enough motivation. Here I became worse than them. I, at least my parents always had a roof over their head. So for me, it wasn't about getting rich. It wasn't, I'm telling you, never in a million years I think that I'd be in Russia. I'm heading to Latvia after this. I have a client back there who, when he came to us, he was $60,000 in debt. He wasn't doing good in his business. Today, his business has multiplied. He owns a language school. He, he had, how many students did you have when you first came to us, Andres? 60 students. He now has 1,600 students in his language school. He started with eight employees. Now he has 130 employees. I never thought in a million years I'd be here. I didn't start that initial business because of having a big vision. It was because of necessity is what it was. One final question, and then we'll do wrap up. Hold it. Thank you very much. You inspired us so much. Could you please tell me if uh, in your life you had a kind person who helped you, a first person who got you rolling? No. Which is why I'm so passionate about helping people. 
When I was homeless, nobody. No, not a single person, not my family. When I called my family and told them that I was uh, homeless, uh, and, and it was Christmas, it's Christmas. I even called my aunt, who I thought for sure would send me a little bit of money for food. And she says, you know, I, I didn't have you on my Christmas list this year. So I'm very passionate about using my life to help other people to succeed and passionate about having others get that same passion. I have seen worlds change, people's worlds change. I've seen communities change as a direct result of, of people getting a completely different mindset of who can I help to succeed. That was my marketing plan from day one. It's still my marketing plan to this day is who can I help to succeed. I believe that when you provide great service for people and that you do not over promise and under deliver, but that you under promise and over deliver and you shock people by honoring them, caring for them, finding the need that they have and how do you meet that need. And that need is much bigger than what we think on the surface. There's underlying needs. And so the thing that I focused on that those initial millionaires taught me was to, to look at, to learn more about people than you do your product line. Learn more about people than you do anything else and you'll be unusually successful. Find people that, that are in a position that have knowledge that you can learn from and learn those new skills. The bottom line, friends, is that the marketplace pays for value. What value do you bring to the marketplace? That's the bottom line. And it's not your personality. It's not your looks. It's not who you know. I don't know any of the right people, but I ended up on the Oprah Winfrey show. I don't know the right people, but I've had opportunity thrown at me because of the results we produce for our clients. So you got to focus on results. you got to understand that you bring value to people. But if you don't understand people, you're not going to succeed. That's in my personal opinion of raising up hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs all over the globe. People is the key. They're the ones with the money. People doesn't grow, money doesn't grow on trees. People bring you two things, money and opportunity. If you suck with people, you're going to have a hard time. And if you think you're already good with people, you're wrong. You're wrong. Your current people skills equate into your bank account. You want your bank account to grow? Learn more about people and you'll be unusually successful. Thank you, Danny. What an extraordinary group of entrepreneurs. Thank you so much. Uh, we could have a day-long conversation as well. But I know we are running out of time, and we have final words from Oleg Basharov. Once again, please come to the stage. Uh. Спасибо огромное, Дэнни, потому что этот эмоциональный заряд был такой большой атомной бомбой. Uh, thank you very much, Danny, because uh, it's like a nuclear bomb, you know, charge that you charge the audience so much. And uh, I want to say only one thing in your emotions. Uh, he, he, she never forgets about her hard times. She said uh, they were learning, uh, you know, curve. Uh, and uh, so, but still, they, they don't uh, strike out all the good people. There was a person who told you about the four rules. And there is a joke, you know, that make people equal. Those who, when two invest bankers after the crisis, call each other and uh, just uh, uh, so one of them says, I'm better, I'm better because I now have a very sexy business. I started a very sexy business. I have unconventional proposals and people buying. The second says, and why only unconventional? Do you have a conventional standard proposal? For no standard. I'm an individual entrepreneur. So I don't have a standard proposal. So never give up. This is my model. I especially spoke Russian because if we take this competitive uh, uh, picture, so any entrepreneurship will remind this symbol of our conference, this circle. Uh, we in Russia, I have to speak Russian in spite of uh, the uh, capacity of English. So I'm ashamed when a successful Russian entrepreneurs uh, speaks Russian, so we have uh, special people who will uh, translate into other con competitive language. If I do this conference to sell in America, I have to speak English. It's a must. Uh, and it doesn't matter if uh, it, it, the case is not to like each other. It boils down to professionalism, to speak skills. I uh, prepared uh, two short trainings. One. Uh, uh, from Andrew's presentation, and the other is derived from Elena's presentation. But before that, I want to turn you to a great research done by Harvard, uh, showing you how we are different, how those little stripes and uh, 
made great research and said uh, the culture and mentality are different. So I always have to think what culture uh, I'm going to use to sell my product. If I do not comply, if I do not shape in, all my five opportunities uh, disintegrate. That Andrew said, financiers will not understand me because I do not shape in. My team will not understand me because I cannot communicate. My product will be murky because I understand it, but other people do not. And most important, it will be very untimely because I'm not ready. So I totally agree with you. And simple thing, you are capable, not capable to entrepreneur. Do you want to know if you are good or not? So with me, Ingrid, you too, please. So let's close your eyes and fly to the moon. One, two, three, go. I'm with you. Fly to the moon. Close your eyes and fly to the moon. Beware of pickpocketers. Thank you very much. Not so long. Yeah, don't don't hang up there. Don't get frozen. I'm afraid for your consciousness. If all the people who close their eyes are people who are capable of trust. They do not uh, expect any special manipulation. This is the capacity to do something insane. So please come, go to this column. Let's compare. Please approach. You see everyone who stood up. Thank you very much. You. This is self-control. If you fly to the moon, this is an idea. This is your freedom, your um, uh, creativeness, your entrepreneurship. Uh, but you cannot fly to the moon. And uh, you cannot do business. And uh, your idea has not become an obsession, a purpose, because this is hard work. Andrew is interested to work in Russian because without any skills of competitive communication, a Russian person, Russian mentality, as an oriental mentality, cannot make a target from an idea. And uh, no, no banker will pay for the idea. The target is a product that you need to sell. That's why Andrew needed a, he was a packer, he was packaging, and he had many partners. and. Uh, What's so unclear about the purpose? When I say approach uh, here, the, the speaker, so the Russian mentality will always ask, I will look like a fool. Why should I go? My God, success is uh, uh, going for the target. Each morning you should get up and say, do I have a goal uh, or I don't have? Uh, does it have any result? Can I do something specific to achieve my goal? Yes, I have a goal. I reach it. I'm a successful. And, and this is success. And the second part, definitely boils down to Elena's presentation. She speak about the efficiency. Look, and even the chairs compete, you know, in this room. But this is a very strange, weird for Russian mentality. In the movie, in, for, we pay differently. In the plane, on the plane, we pay differently for different chairs. But then, competing, we are, try, we are not trying to select a place today. So, guy, why don't you see me? I'm here for the last, you know, two kilometers. Please speak up. I cannot hear you. We want to uh, draw something uh, to us. It means that, but we have to venture out to go there. It means that we are not capable for entrepreneurship. Go look because the information uh, creates your target. This is your work. When you make an idea into a plan, you need to communicate. Andrew gave us a great idea. When I go to an employer, he pays me 45 hours. And as a fool, I work over my, over time for free, pro bono. When I'm an individual entrepreneur, I never thought 168 hours I am busy. This is the most horrible controller because this is myself. Only an idiot can cheat on himself. And uh, when I try to pass a fantasy for a target, so I'm a good uh, interpret entrepreneur because I'm at war with myself. So uh, uh, cheating, if if uh, a way to war, if you are far, so show something near. What is self uh, cheat, uh, did, uh, cheating? This is a war with yourself. Be honest uh, to your uh, to towards yourself. This is the main commitment to yourself. If you are going to become an entrepreneur, if you cannot, don't go go uh, and uh, uh, be hired by someone who will honor you. So who want to compete? I started uh, at 13 as a post uh, with a delivery boy and. Uh, in Academy of Sciences and started and then I privatized uh, the uh, premise, in, uh, 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 premise in Moscow. So who want to be employed by me? Thank you. So you lost. You're a loser. Hello. Daniel, good. No, 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 no groups. We wanted, you came to me to borrow money. I hire you to try as an assistant. Good. I hire you uh, for, for a day because I want to understand if I want to be par partnering with you. Who are you for me? No, you are my competitor because I want uh, to take your time, more or less, more, and pay less. What do you want to do? I want 
to do just the opposite. You want to get more, work less. So this is competition. This is controversy because we have not distributed our success and result. But getting hired, you think that you have the partner and everyone should be happy. You know that's what we did in the Soviet time. That we were friends, uh, uh, we, but you don't. You underpay. You find me that uh, I, I'm bad. I'm going to, uh, to to resign. We have very important uh, negotiations with Andrew. We want to sell good pro couple of good projects, and Lena is going to co-finance. You have only two minutes. You either get the money and share, or you get nothing and uh, see it. Look at your salary. I don't know if, yeah, uh, uh, organize the table. Just clean the table. Do clean the table. That's how Russians fly on into space. And could you please tell me when I come here, do I pay anything? No. Why? Because it's not in my job description. You see? There's a Russian guy, the state underpays. Deputy State Duma is at fault. This was not. No, you are my partner. You shook my hand. I asked you to clean the table. Why are you staying here showing off and without cleaning? But the first one is to talk to Andrew. And speaking to Andrew is my goal. Clean the table. Table is dirty. Andrew will not come. Look, good. Russian person will complain. He doesn't understand what he's doing. You will never be like Lena because you are dumb. You are just doing something. Clean the table. Why? The bottles are not even. Why? Oh, you see? This is rebellion, yeah. Why are you here? Why are you up to say you? Why you should have asked before you shake my hand? This is your goal. Because when you work for me, you have no right to ask why. You should. I say jump, you say how high. What he should ask? after how how high not why should I because how is how you do it Russian psychology is un unfortunately you know can go to the moon okay let's fly to the moon close your eyes fly to the moon but go to the door no this is too tough Un until you understand what is my goal that I said and you toil to get true information about it, uh, changing the methodology, because you compete with me, and I'm being cunning, you know, I'm we. I'm, 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 uh, I, I want to do something with that, I want to underpay you and make you work for me, this is my capacity, my, my language, my verbal communication, no matter what you do in Russian, it's Russian, you have to learn, you need to see the target beyond the words, you have to read behind the lines, only proper information will give you the uh, info, because that's why the front row is always expensive, because if you are the first to get coherent information, then you set the proper targets and, re and achieve success. Once you are successful, you're efficient, got it? So the first thing to learn if you want to be entrepreneur. So always look at your partner com partner or competitor and break your language into top two parts. Because when you ask me how, you specify our target and you make our target common. You get, uh, 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 you, 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 you become a partner because you um, eliminate this kind of cunning uh, from my speech and you become my partner. Good luck. Thank you. Deep breath. That was that was really helpful and uh, really wonderful. And I I, I want to again thank our presenters here today. You got three very different viewpoints. We got the perspective from what it's like to do business in Russia. Actually, from two of you, three of you. Thank you so much. And Danny, thank you for your very very inspiring story. You were all amazing. Thank you so much. And for the four of you, if you'll come up here, I want to take a picture real quick before we break. So round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to.